Here's what God says through Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says, All Scripture is God-breathed, and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good thing. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. That's what it claims. And so what we want to do in this video is we want to put the Bible uh, to the test. We, we want to put the Bible on trial. Just as in the last three videos we put God on trial, we're going to put the Bible on trial. And we're going to ask, is there some evidence that would prove that the Bible isn't the Word of God, or is there some evidence that would prove the Bible is the Word of God? Uh, most of the time when I have this conversation with people and I ask them, what evidence do you have that the Bible isn't the Word of God, uh, they don't have a whole lot to say. They will occasionally say, well, uh, you know, it's not historically accurate. Or, well, uh, they, you know, the way that they put the documents together, the way that they put the Bible together. Usually their information comes from uh, some show on the History Channel or the National Geographic Channel uh, that is... I don't mean to be blunt, but it's just full of lies and false information. You know, it'll be about the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Judas and how they should have been involved in the canon or that the Bible was created by the, the church, you know, 300 years after uh, Jesus' life. And it was just, it was, they make it feel like it was just this arbitrary group of people that got together and said, hey, yeah, let's throw these books together. And there's all these books that are left out and it's a conspiracy. And so therefore you can't trust the Bible. That's what I get. And I want you to know none of that is true. None of that is true. And I'm going to show you that today. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put the Bible on trial. Uh, there's a lot of information here. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm going to keep it like I did with the existence of God at a at a 50,000 foot level. I'm going to give you some things to think about, and then if you will go check them out, you'll find that what I'm saying is true. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask three questions about the Bible because a lot of people say that the Bible is not true. It's not the Word of God. It's myth. It's legend. It's whatever. So we're going to ask three questions: Is the Bible unique? Is the Bible accurate and is the Bible inspired? Okay, so let's begin with unique. And I just want you to think about these things. Not one of these uh, evidences is going to absolutely prove the Bible is the Word of God, but I think when it's put all together, I think the evidence is so conclusive that beyond a reasonable doubt we can know that the Bible is the Word of God. So is it unique? Absolutely. It's very unique in its composition. Listen to this, and if you're familiar with Christianity at all, I'm sure you've heard this quote. The Bible is composed of 66 books written over a 1,600-year span by 40 different authors from 40 different generations from numerous walks of life in various moods and different literary forms on three different continents in three different languages. And yet, as a whole, the Bible has a remarkable continuity or unity about it on a variety of subjects. I don't know if you've ever heard that quote, but that's, that's a pretty well-known quote for those who have done study of the Bible. So when you think about it, okay, this, this book, the Bible, this is my Bible, uh, this thing is, is a lot of pages. It's over 2,000 pages the way that mine is put together. And it was written over 1,600 years. Now think about how unique that makes the Bible. Every other book is written, what, in a year or two years or five years or ten years. It's written by one author or two or a collaboration of a few contemporaries. And that's how books are written. But the Bible was written over 1,600 years. I want you to think about that. Forty different authors from all parts of life, three continents, three different languages. Many of them writing never knew about the writings of the other people. And yet, can you imagine someone writing over here and someone writing over here and someone writing over here and they're writing all these things and yet they come together seamlessly and perfectly without contradiction? How is that possible? How is that possible? And yet that's exactly what happened in the Bible. Now you may say, well, there's contradictions in the Bible. Look, the Bible is very clear that God wrote the Bible through human beings, but He allowed human beings to give their thoughts and expressions. They weren't in a trance when they were writing. And so in the Gospels, for example, the guys remembered different things from those stories and saw it from different point of views. And so there's minor differences in the way they tell the stories. 
But the overarching theme and truth of the story is identical throughout the Bible. It is very unique in its composition. It's also unique in its circulation. I want you to think about this. It has sold billions of copies more than any other book. It's been a bestseller for 200 years. I want you to think about that, billions more. If you'll just Google best-selling books of all time, what you'll see is Bible, five billion. That's what you'll get, five billion. Second book is uh, the Communist uh, Manifesto from China, basically one billion copies, one billion copies. Think about how many people are in China. Basically, the Chinese government took the, the, the manifesto, <laughs> created a billion copies, and gave them to every person that lives in China. Next is the Koran at about 800 million, and then it drops to about 150 million there uh, with the Lord of the Rings, by the way. But the Bible has sold four billion more copies than any other book. That makes it very, very unique. The question comes, why do so many people buy a Bible? Why do people not throw Bibles away? Why do people buy four or five Bibles? Why are people, I, I know people and they just, they just can't throw a Bible away. Well, why is that? Because intrinsically they know the Bible is the Word of God. These are sacred words. I mean, you take your latest novel and you, and you sell it in a garage sale or take it to Goodwill or throw it in the trash. You don't think a thing about it, but nobody can get rid of a Bible. Isn't that interesting? The Bible is unique in its translation. It's been translated in uh, more than any other book in history by far. Most books are translated into 8 or 10 or 15 or 20 different languages. The Bible has been translated into over 2,400 languages. It has been translated into every national language in the world except for the Maldives, which is a small island off India where most of the people speak English. So the Bible literally has been translated into every national language in the entire world. No other book comes even close to that. Why is that? What is it about the Bible that it, it, is, it, just, it, it, it is manufactured and sent everywhere? It's because people, millions and millions and millions of people, believe and see that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. It is unique in its durability. It survived burnings, bans, and critics. It cannot be destroyed. It absolutely cannot be destroyed. It is supernatural in origin. Um, there have been different countries that have banned the Bible. You can't have Bibles in this country, and yet they keep showing up. They can't get rid of them. Countries will ban Christianity. Christianity continues to grow in that country. That country will die and go away. Christianity will stay. It's happened many, many times over the last 2,000 years. The country will say no Bibles, no Christians, no Christian thought. A hundred years later, that country's gone and the Bible is there and the Christians are there. I've, I've got to tell you a story that's, that's amazing. There's a missionary working in the Middle East. I'm not going to tell you what country for the sake of safety in case this, uh, this uh, uh, video ends up in the wrong hands. But he was uh, delivering Bibles into a country where it's illegal to have Bibles. And so they had this, this Jeep, and it was him and a couple of, of Christians from that country. And they had all these Bibles, and they were driving along this dirt road, and they're scared about getting caught, and they know what happens if they do get caught. And suddenly their car breaks down. Their Jeep breaks down. They pull off the side of the road. They can't figure out what's wrong with it. They can't get it started. And suddenly they see uh, the leaders from the village walking up to them. And, of course, they're nervous because what do they have in the back? They have contraband. They have the Bible. And so these guys walk up to him and said, did you bring us the book? And they said, what? What are you talking about? And they said, we have been having these visions where a man in white named Jesus is coming to us and he's telling us he's bringing us a book. And we're supposed to read the book. Did you bring us the book? And of course, the missionary realized what God had done is, is he had set them up to deliver these, these Bibles to this village. And so the, the, the village took the Bibles, read them, that village became Christian. They stay there for a couple of days, then they got to get back on the road and deliver more Bibles. They got to figure out what's wrong with the truck though. So they get in and it starts right up. God had simply stopped that truck right there to deliver those Bibles miraculously into the hands of those people. That's the things God does 
with the Bible. The Bible cannot be destroyed. It is certainly unique. And then finally, it is unique in its impact on lives. It's unique in its impact on lives. There are millions of people, millions of people that will gather this week in groups to study the Bible. And they will study it and they'll meet next week to study it again. They will read the Bible through 35, 40, 50, 100 times. And every time they say they read it, they get something else out of it. Because the Bible is the inspired Word of God, Hebrews chapter 4 says it's, it's alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, and it, it, and it will cut you to the core of your being, revealing your innermost thoughts and motives. When you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. And that's why you can go to a passage and you read it and get something out of it. And the next time you read it, you get something else out of it. But the Bible always has something to say to speak to your absolute current situation right now. It is supernatural. It is inspired by God. You don't read the Bible. The Bible reads you and gives you the application you need for your life. That's what happens with millions of Christians every day all over the world. There are people that read this daily. There are millions of people that meet weekly to study it. You know, Oprah has a, a, a reading club, but you know, they don't, they don't read and study their books the way people study the Bible. They'll read a book together, they'll make some comments, and then they discard it and go to another book. People who are reading the Bible, they just stay in it time after time after time after time. There's something unique about the Bible, supernatural, that people can't explain. But they say, when I'm reading it, it's reading me. And every time I read it, it tells me exactly what I needed for my circumstance in life at that very moment. Is the Bible unique? Absolutely, it is unique. But is it accurate? Is it accurate? There, there, there was a, a time, uh, I would say the 70s, 80s, 90s, where there was a lot of discussion about, well, the Bible's inaccurate. Uh, that, that there are these secular annals out there that record history, and when you compare them to the biblical record, the Bible doesn't meet what is happening in, and been recorded in secular history. Therefore, the Bible's wrong, and, and that's what they say. And yet what's interesting is, as archaeology has advanced and science has advanced, and we have uncovered so many things over in the Middle East, every time they do an archaeological dig, they'll find something that will end up showing that the Bible is true after all. Let me just give you uh, one example. Daniel 5 refers to Belshazzar as the king of Babylon. Okay, But historical documents said that Nebuchadnezzar was the king. And so for years they said, see, the Bible is not accurate. The Bible is wrong. Well, archaeologists discovered three stones that said when Nebuchadnezzar went to war, he named his son Belshazzar to be king in his absence. So that's why the Bible says Belshazzar was king. It, it turned out to be accurate after all. So after many, many years of archaeological digs, here is the conclusion. Nelson Gluck, who is a Jewish archaeological expert, and not a believer, by the way, says this, It may be categorically stated that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. So if you want to ask the question, is the Bible accurate as, with regard to secular annals and archaeology, the answer is absolutely, completely, every single time it has been proven to be accurate. As opposed to the Book of Mormon that is based on history, and yet these historical events in the Book of Mormon have no evidence outside of that book itself that those events ever took place. But in the Bible, you have these events, and then you have all these secular historians that are recording the same events to show that the events of the Bible actually happened. And so the Bible is very accurate. Manuscript evidence, this is important. Is the Bible accurate? One of the, the things that people say is, well, you can't trust the Bible because you know, we don't know what we have today is the same Bible as what they had back then, and there was corruption when they were, when they were uh, writing it from one, uh, one Bible to the next Bible to the next Bible. So, so let me talk to you a little bit about that, okay? First of all, when you go to university and you study Philosophy 101, the first thing you're going to learn is about Aristotle and Plato. Aristotle and Plato 
are kind of the fathers of Western thought. They are the fathers of philosophy, and you will learn about them. And when that professor begins to talk about the thoughts of Aristotle and, and Plato, they will never question uh, the authenticity of the words of their documents, uh, how the documents were put together, how the documents were translated, and if they were translated appropriately. They never question the historicity or the accuracy of what's going on in those documents. And yet, if we put all of the documents together that we have for Aristotle and Plato, you know what the number is? Less than 10. Less than 10. Most of those ancient documents, we will find one copy or two copies or maybe three copies of their, of their writings or parts of their writings. We find very few. There's one exception to that. Anybody want to guess what that exception is? That exception is the Bible. The Bible has over 14,000 copies, ancient copies that we have discovered. Over 14,000. Do you find it a little bit supernatural? Do you find it at least unusual that Aristotle and Plato, we can't find but four or five or six copies of their stuff, and, and Socrates and everyone else, and yet when it comes to the Bible, we have 14,000 documents? Do you think maybe the Holy Spirit had something to do with that? Do you think maybe God worked supernaturally to protect His Word for His people? Let me tell you how they accurately uh, got Scripture into 14,000 copies and how we know it is so accurate today. Okay? There, there were people back then called scribes. Scribes' job was to make a copy of the copy that they received. Um, they didn't have printing presses. That's how they uh, disseminated information. Uh, scribes uh, disseminated information uh, in secular history and in biblical history. Okay, well, the Jewish scribes that, that uh, wrote both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they knew they were dealing with God's Word. They knew they were dealing with sacred documents. And so they took every precaution necessary to make sure that every single word was accurately uh, taken from one uh, copy to the next copy. And so here's what they would do. They would take it line by line. And this line, uh, the first scribe would write that line. He would hand the document to the second scribe, who would then compare it back to the document to make sure that line by line, word by word, everything was absolutely perfect. At the end of a page, they counted the number of words, and if the number of words on that page did not equal the number of words on this page, they had to tear it up and start all over. That's how meticulous they were. So in other words, it was very, very difficult for someone to just take a copy of the Word of God and add what they wanted to add because they had another scribe looking over their shoulder making sure it was absolutely perfect. Now, was it absolutely perfect? No, there were, there were small matters. There, there were times where some of these scribes would, would come together and add a little phrase. And so what happens is out of 14,000 documents, you'll find a series of documents maybe out of let's say North Africa, that added a little phrase to a certain verse, and so you have 300 copies from North Africa that have that phrase. Well, because you have another 13,700 copies that don't have that phrase, we know that phrase was added by those scribes. And so we're able to, because of the volume of copies, know exactly what was the original writing and what was added the few times that it was added through history to take those out to make it accurate. The Bible is the absolutely the most accurate uh, ancient book ever recorded, and we know because of the way they put it together that they did it perfectly, and it's exactly what God wanted us to have. There's 185,000, I'm sorry, 184,590 words in the New Testament. There's only 400 words that are on the disputable list, and they're small words, and they have not changed the message at all. The document of the Bible we have today is an accurate representation of the Bible they had in the first century, in the second century, in the third century because of the painstaking way in which they made sure that it was accurate. And so the manuscript evidence says that the Bible is incredibly accurate. It's exactly what we have today is what they had back then. God assured it because He worked through that process.
Now, people will go, yeah, but what about the way the Bible was put together? I mean, the, the Catholic Church in 300 A.D. put together this assembly and they voted on these books and they left out all these other books and they left them out because there was, because there was a conspiracy in the church and there was corruption in the church and so the Bible is corrupt. None of that is true. None of that is true. When, when they codified the Bible in the third century and began to say these are the 27 books that are going to be in the New Testament, they were simply making official what the early church had known all the way back to Jesus' day. And I want to show you that out of Scripture. I'm going to take you to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter is writing this book in probably around 70 A.D. Jesus died in 33 A.D. So we're talking, you know, not very many years after Jesus had died. The apostles were still alive. The apostles were the ones that were with Jesus and, and began the process of writing down all of this information. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, started writing in about uh, probably 55 A.D. and wrote to about 65 A.D. That was where most of his writings were. Okay, So his writings at the time Peter wrote this were 5 to 15 years old, depending on the book. Okay, So here's what Peter says. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. In 70 A.D., Peter writes and says, the things that Paul wrote five years ago and ten years ago, we already recognize them as Scripture. They are Scripture. And so it wasn't that a bunch of people got together and took a vote 300 years later and says, hey, let's just put all these books together and make our Bible. No, from the very beginning, the first generation of apostles knew what Scripture was and what Scripture wasn't. And the church... They, they, had, they had not officially codified, but they had this body of evidence that these are the books that are the New Testament. And all that happened in the third century was they made that official. And there's a reason that the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas and all of these other books aren't in there. That's because from the very beginning, the apostles had some very strict criteria on what would, would be Scripture and wouldn't, and it had everything to do with authorship and and the doctrine within those books. And the 27 that are in there were seen from the very beginning and are codified together. And so there is not a corruption in the church that caused the Bible to, to leave out a bunch of books that should have been in there. The Holy Spirit orchestrated that process. So the Bible is very, very accurate in the way it was put together and the way it has been recorded and kept throughout the ages. Finally, accuracy. I, I want to talk a little bit about the miracles because uh, people get hung up on the miracles and say, well, the Bible is ridiculous because look at all these miracles. These miracles couldn't have happened. And we'll talk about this a little bit uh, next week in the video on Jesus and Jesus claims to be the Son of God. But I want you to think about miracles for a minute. The Pharisees hated Jesus. They hated him, but they didn't want to kill him. They ended up having to kill him because that was their last resort. But you know what they wanted? They wanted to discredit him. There were many men in the first century that claimed to be the Messiah that would gather followers, and they would discredit them, uh, or the Roman government would come in and squash the movement. But they just wanted to discredit Jesus is all they wanted to do. All they had to do was discredit Jesus, was show that one of his miracles was fake. Find somebody who said, yeah, he paid me off to pretend he did this. Find somebody that says, yeah, this is how Jesus does his tricks. Find somebody to admit that the miracles weren't real. Or, or just as interestingly, the secular annals of that time recorded the miracles as well as fact. And so the miracles are actually proof that the Bible is indeed the Word of God because they are true. And the reason we know they are true is because 
the wealthiest, most powerful people in that culture were doing everything they could to disprove and discredit Jesus who performed the miracles. And as hard as they tried, they couldn't discredit any of them. Which leads you to know what? They're true. But we'll talk about that more next week. So finally, we're going to ask the final question, and that is this. Is the Bible, is the Bible inspired? Is the Bible inspired? A couple things I want to say on this. The Bible is so true in what it says about me and what it says about you. It's true about who we are, about how we feel, about our insecurities, about our deepest needs, about our desire for love, about our sin condition, about our relationship with God, about how God has set up a plan to give us our best life. The Bible is so true. Remember at the beginning I talked about how the Bible reads us. We don't read the Bible. The Bible is so true it reads us and then gives us exactly what we need for the abundant life. And that's how we know the Bible is inspired, one of the ways. But but the primary way, uh, evidence-wise, is in the fulfillment of prophecy. Remember what I told you at the beginning that the Bible was written over the 1,600-year span. Well, I want you to think about this. There were prophets that were writing prophecies about Jesus, saying, this is going to happen. And they're writing them in 7 and 8 and 900 B.C., and Jesus is coming in, of course, 0 A.D., basically 30 A.D. So there's eight or 900 years difference. And they're writing prophecies about his lineage, where he was born, how he was going to live, how he died, his resurrection, even the method of his death, crucifixion. And at the time they're writing it, crucifixion had not been invented yet. That was not invented until way later on. And so they're writing and predicting things that haven't even been invented yet about the coming Messiah and how he would be born and live and die. There are, in all, 332 references to the coming Messiah, and 61 of them Jesus directly fulfilled in the New Testament. 61 prophecies He fulfilled. Well, there is a a man, uh, and, and his name is Peter Stoner, and he's a mathematician, and he said, you know, this is highly unlikely. It, it's kind of like what we talked about when we were talking about the, uh, God and the existence of God and all of the physics principles that have to come together perfectly. It's so mathematically impossible for it to be happened by accident that there had to be a creator. Well, this is the same way. What's the mathematical probabilities that somebody can be writing prophecies back here in the 8th century and the 9th century? Not one guy, but four or five or six or eight or ten guys writing these prophecies not corroborating with each other, and then eight or nine hundred years later, they all come true in detail accurately in the life of Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't, he didn't do the, the, the math for all 61 uh, references uh, that he fulfilled or prophecies that he fulfilled. He did eight, and when he did the mathematical probabilities of Jesus fulfilling eight Old Testament prophecies, He said the odds of only eight of the prophecies being fulfilled is one times 10 to the 17th power or one times 100 quadrillion. And if you double the fulfilled prophecies to 16, the probability grows to one in 10 to the 45th power. Write down 45 zeros at the end of your your 10 and that's the probability that Jesus would have fulfilled in prophecy 16. He fulfilled 61. How do I know the Bible's inspired? I'll tell you exactly how I know the Bible's inspired, because of prophecy. How can you explain other than it being the living, active Word of God that all of these people write these things and hundreds of years later they come in detail? They come to pass in the life of Jesus Christ. Well, you say, well, yeah, but Jesus could have known them, and so He did them on purpose. He didn't choose His lineage. He didn't choose His birthday. He he didn't choose His method of execution. There are so many things that He was out of control of. Now, he, yeah, He could have made a couple of comments on the cross that He knew He needed to say. I'll give you that. But what about all the others? You know how I know the Word of God is true? Because of what it says about me. 
and the way it impacts my life and the way it reads me and the way it changes me and the way it gives me exactly what I need at every moment that I need it. How do I know the Bible is the Word of God? Because God kept it uh, so accurately preserved throughout 2,000 years. How do I know the Bible is the Word of God? Because through it, I've met God. And He's changed my life. And I know the character of God now. And when I read the Bible, it rings true and matches His character. The evidence is overwhelming. I think the verdict is in. The Bible's not just a book. You don't just read it and throw it away. It's the inspired Word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the Word. Thank You for what it means to us. Thank You for its accuracy and its beauty. Thank You for the fulfilled prophecies that help prove that You wrote this book. Thank You for the way it reads me and changes me to be the man that You want me to be. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that every person watching this, Lord, that they are pricked in their spirit and they know that they know that they know that what I'm saying today is true, that the Bible is your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.